Good morning, Bayside. Good morning. Are you thankful that God doesn't expect perfection from us? Are you thankful for that? <laughs> we, we've, had a, we've had a morning, I'll just tell you that. Uh, our lights aren't working, so we're like subbing in lights. Like, we've got 19 bulbs out over here. Like, uh, the air conditioner is choosing not to work this morning. So, but you know what? In spite of all that, we can worship God, amen? And that's what, it, that's what it's about, right? I don't think the early disciples had all the lights and all the things anyway. So would you stand this morning as we just worship a risen Savior? grace is sufficient for each one of us. Amen. And I am so thankful for that today. Let's sing this song together.
that maybe you don't know this morning, introduce yourself and tell them good morning. Good morning, Bayside. I got to get my high fives here, my handshakes. All good. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad you're here worshiping with us. Is there joy in the house of the Lord this morning? Is there joy in your heart this morning? Oh, oh, that's it. I love it. All right. And with that said, kids. Oh, wait. Hold on. I don't know what I'm doing, but that's okay. Hold tight just for a minute. Hey, we're so glad you're here worshiping with us this morning. If you are new, if you have never filled out a contact card for us and you'd like to get more information about our church, there's a contact card in the chair in front of you or somewhere close by. If you would fill that out, put it in the offering bucket as it goes by, I would love to get you more information about our church. Just tell you a little bit more about who we are and why we exist and, uh, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions of me or about our church, our ministries, or anything. Is, uh, and also on there is, is the 
place for you to put prayer requests. We love to pray for our people, and most of you know we have an awesome prayer team, awesome prayer team, and you can put your prayer requests on that card, and we will be praying for you throughout the week. We also love to hear about praises. We love to hear what God is doing in the hearts and lives of his people, and God is doing some amazing things here in Bayside in the hearts and lives of our people, both inside our, our church family, outside in our community, and we like to hear about those things because it's just affirmation of what God is doing in us and through us and affirmation of his love for us. So with that said, a couple things going on that we need to bring your attention to. Tonight is the family night Peter Pan Papa Play. I'm not saying that fast three times. Thank you. Peter Pan Papa Play. So it's all free. Free is good, right? Y'all like free because nothing is free in our culture anymore. But come and hang out. We're going to be starting to serve food at 5 o'clock. There's going to be chili cheese nachos or any combination thereof, chili hot dogs or any combination thereof. Uh, there's going to be popcorn machine going on. Oh, let there be light. I like it. And there will be some dessert. We'll have waters. At 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, we'll have some tables outside. We'll have some games set up. Uh, cornhole game and a ladder ball game and some other stuff going on. And then at 6 o'clock, the doors will probably open around 5.35, 5.40. You can come in, and at 6 o'clock, the play will start. It lasts about an hour. Elaine and I went and saw it uh, on Friday night at one of the local establishments, and it was really, really fun. It's really cool. It's just a good time of family. So come and be part of that. Invite people, folks. This is an opportunity for Bayside for, for, to bring somebody that might not ordinarily set foot in a church because it's church, this is totally non-threatening, non-church, but yet still an opportunity for us to extend who we are with invite cards, whatever. So bring your families out. Come out and enjoy. We're going to clear out a couple of rows here in front. The kids are going to come and sit. There's a little bit of participation from the kids in the front row. So come and plan to be part of that tonight, okay? It's going to be a great time. Also, then a week from tonight, we get back on our series with Job. This is our group link. This is our small group format. At this time around, we're doing it all church. It's Sunday night at 5 o'clock. We eat together. <laughs> when you guys bring food, you knock it out of the park. I mean, it's all good. Yeah, that's my brother Ed back there. We, we, we eat heartily. But we do. We have a great time of fellowship. Last Sunday night was awesome. It was a kickoff of Job. We're just getting started and every week stands alone. So if you missed last week, that's okay. Come and be part of it. It's on Right Now Media. If you would like a, to, to join and be able to get on Right Now Media and follow with what, what we're doing, you can email me. My email address is on the back of the bulletin, and I can get you an, an invitation to, to Right Now Media, and you can follow along with us as we go. Or if you have to miss a week, then you can catch up and see where we're going with that. So plan to be part of that a week from tonight. Now, I don't know, how many of you were involved in our annual yard sale yesterday? A whole bunch of you, and there was one fan of you. I heard a clap, but you're going to hear a whole lot more about that. So I'm going to ask our children's director, Miss Bethany, if you will come up and if you will share a little bit about yesterday. Oh, right. Come on, this yeah. is our children's director, folks. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. So if you were here yesterday, you're probably as tired as I am, right? Yeah? A yeah, little tired? Are. Yes. Um, so I wanted to first thank you guys so much for all of your hard work over the past week. If you don't know, they collect items three nights through the week, sort them, um, price them, and then we were here all day yesterday from 6 to 2. That is a ton of work, but I wanted to tell you guys that we raised so much money. Um, we raised $2,600 yesterday yeah. for kids camp. That, I mean, people love their stuff. It is, it's incredible <laughs> to watch people just get so excited over the stuff. Um, and it's really fun to tell them it's two bucks and they're like, oh my gosh. So um, $2,600, you add that to our pasta fundraiser money um, we have raised over $6,000 for kids camp this year. We have 15 kids going to camp. Their camp will be paid for um, because of you guys. So Thank you. That That's awesome. Thank you. They will be going to camp the last week of July. Um, they'll be up at Frontier Ranch um, in Santa Cruz. And I just um, encourage you, I want one more thing from you. Pray for our kids that week of July. Um, it's 
so fun. I mean, they're going to go to the beach. They're going to do all the things, but they are going to meet Jesus at a whole new level, and I am so excited for that. I went as a fourth grader, fifth grader, all the way through. I worked there. It's incredible. So just please be praying for our kids. If your kid is not one of the 15 that's going, put them on the wait list. It's totally worth it. You don't have to pay anything, um, and they might get in. We've had a couple kids get in, but next December... Sign your kids up right away. It fills up in two weeks. <laughs> December. So next December. That's crazy, I'm telling you right? Now, put it in your phone. It's amazing. So I just thank you guys so much for just all your hard work, your generosity over these fundraisers. It's um, incredible, and I'm just so thankful. So thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. Right. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Before you leave, there's something else coming up oh, that we need to, to remind <laughs> people of. Just a little thing coming up, right? <laughs> we have breakaway coming up really soon um <laughs> again incredible i don't know what our numbers are for registration but we're like three quarters or more full so kids are signing up like insanely volunteers have been signing up too jen how many volunteers do we have signed up it's incredible 87 87 volunteers, volunteers. Signed up Woo! So far. that's awesome that's uh, you guys but we still need you <laughs> still don't really? take that as we don't need you but incredible opportunity for our kids it's so fun as a church uh you think the yard sale is exhausting breakaway is like way more exhausting but in an amazingly good way it's so fun so fun so fun so sign up your kids uh before it fills up because it will fill up our building's not huge and if you want to be involved in it talk to jen or me um we'll get you fingerprinted and um plugged in for an amazing week so june 19th 23rd. Where do they go to sign up? Um, you go online. It's right there. Go right there. Right there. Up. Behind If you me. want to volunteer, talk to Jen or me. Um, hey, you get dinner all week. You don't have to make dinner all week. That, that's enough for me. So sign up. We'll feed you. We'll have so much fun. It's incredible. Um, come talk to us and we'll get you plugged in. But thank there. you guys. You, this church is amazing. So I am just so thankful. Great. Thank you, Bethany. <laughs> Kids, you can go. You know, I was going to say, hey, parents, it's a date night, right? You can drop your kids off and, and go out to dinner. Wrong. We need you here helping. So I don't want to go there, all right? But anyway, plan to be part of that great time. So with that said, let's go ahead and have our ushers come on forward. Let's take our offering. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, what a privilege to be in your house, to be in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the universe the creator of this world, the creator of us as individuals, each one unique in your sight, here this morning to worship you, to see you lifted up and glorified. Father God, I just pray that whatever baggage we came through the door with this morning, that we'd leave it there. We'd leave it in your hands. Trust in you to take care of it, whatever that is, and that when we leave this morning, that we don't pick it up and take it back with us, that we leave it right there in your care. Father God, speak into our hearts this morning through your word, through your worship. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you this morning. And all God's people said, amen.
joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my King. You are my King. Jesus, you God, we thank you that in the midst of all these little things that are maybe not going 100% that we would like them this morning, God, you're still king. God, you're still on the throne. You still see us as your children. And God, you've forgiven us. You've given us your grace. And we just worship you this morning. God, you are worthy of our praise today. And God, would you just teach us something amazing from your word this morning, God, that we could take with us today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We did pay the light bill. There's evidence of that. So thanks for being here this morning. Uh, I mean, this, it's springtime, right? This weather is amazing, isn't it? Yesterday I was struck, with, I was driving around with my grandkids, and my little grandson has a way of homing in on every bouncy house in the neighborhood. <laughs> and it was like every block. It was like, Papa, there's a, there's a bouncy house. There's another one. Oh, look, there's a, must have been a lot of people having birthday parties. Must have been a lot of people outdoors. We drove down, drove by Lodi Lake. I mean, it was packed. People are outdoors enjoying the experience, enjoying the weather, aren't they? And this is the time of year when we turn to, our thoughts turn to things like going camping and going to the beach and just enjoying God's creation as he gave it to us to enjoy. I used to love to, I still do, but I don't get out and do it as much anymore as I used to, but I, I used to go backpacking quite a bit. And for those of you who have never experienced it, you got to love it. You put a 40 or 50 pound pack, you hike in two, three, four, five miles, you sleep on the ground, you eat freeze dried food like ramen and mac and cheese, and then a couple days later, you pack it all up and you put it on your back and you walk back out again. It's great fun. But the best part about it is when you get to where you're going, and it's awesome wherever it is you're going because you don't backpack in the inner city, right? You backpack somewhere beautiful. And, and we would, there was this one particular place that we used to go. It was up in the headwaters of the Tuolumne River, and we would camp pretty close to the river, crystal clear water. And if you've ever sat beside a stream and just watched the water trickle through, there's something magical about that. There's something spiritual about seeing that water flowing down and, and we used to like to go and stick our feet in and cool our feet off because there'd be some swelling. And, and then in my younger day, we would take, we had canteens. Yes, we, you know, if, for those of you who don't know what a canteen is, you know, it was a metal thing that probably weighed five pounds with the water in it. We'd go down to the stream and we'd fill it up and we'd drink it. We never heard of a thing called giardia. And if you've ever been in the outdoors and if you've ever looked at water and thought, man, that water looks crystal clear, don't be fooled. 
There's a little microorganism that, that lives in water called Giardia. Let me, let me tell you what it looks like. And there's, we have a picture on the slide up there, uh, if, if we can fire that slide up there of the Giardia. Yeah, there's, there's a picture. Okay, so this is not an artist's rendition, folks. This is an actual microscope photo of the Giardia bacteria. It looks like something from outer space, doesn't it? And you ask yourself, God, why would you create something like that? I don't know the answer to that, and you're not going to get an answer for that, okay? So, but that's not the point of the message. But the Mayo Clinic describes it like this. Giardia infection is an intestinal infection marked by stomach cramps, bloating, nausea, sorry, bouts of watery diarrhea. So some of you in the medical field, I'm looking, I see Mark and Sheila and some of you. You, you guys, this is probably old hat for you, but this is like, this is like, to me, going out and enjoying the outdoors is like scary stuff. Giardia infection is caused by a microscopic parasite that is found worldwide, especially in areas with poor sanitation and unsafe water. However, Giardia infection is one of the most common causes of waterborne diseases in the United States. The parasites are found in backcountry streams and lakes, but also in public water supplies, swimming pools, whirlpool spas, and wells. When the service is over, we're all going to go jump in the Galt community pool and have a big pool party. Makes you stop and think twice, doesn't it? About the water coming out of your tap, about what's in that swimming pool that you're going to go jump. Even what's in that beautiful crystal clear stream that's coming out of the mountains. Well, this one particular time, we were there, and, and we liked to fish, and so we would split up, and my buddy would go downstream, and, and this particular time, he went downstream, I went upstream, and we had just filled our canteens with water, and I go up, and I'm beating through the bush and, and you know, sneaking it up on the water and everything, and I got about a couple hundred yards up from our campsite. There were three cows standing in the middle of the river. One of them had its tail raised. I just filled my canteen, folks from down below where this water was flowing from, I never did that again. I either boiled the water or I got one of those uh, catered-in water filter system that, that filters the water for you. You may have intestinal problems long after the parasites are gone. Several drugs are generally effective against Giardia parasites, but not everyone responds to them. Prevention is the best defense. Let that sink in just for a minute as we get into our message this morning. Prevention is the best defense. Last week, for those of you who are new or haven't been here for a while, we've been going through a series called Cradle to Cross, and we've just been digging into the life of Christ, and we've been looking into the significant uh, events in the life of Jesus and what they mean to us from a cultural relevancy and from, from us from a personal standpoint. And what we, what we get from the example that Christ set when he was walking here on the earth. And we saw last week how he went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And much to their surprise, and much to everyone's surprise around them, in a righteous anger, Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple. The, the corruption and the chaos, the commerce that was going on in the temple was unacceptable in the eyes of God unacceptable in the eyes of God because God cannot and will not tolerate sin. God revealed to us at that moment through his son Jesus that he will not tolerate sin and corruption in our hearts and in our lives. There's always results for sin in our hearts and in our lives. But ultimately what it did reveal is it revealed Jesus as the high priest because Annas, who was the high priest at the time, was condoning all this garbage that was going on in the temple. The very man that God had instituted and put in place there, who was in charge of the temple, was allowing this chaos to go on. But when Jesus came and cleared the temple, he said, no, I am now the high priest. He didn't say that at this moment. He will later. But he gave us the example that he was coming to do away with the old law, that he was coming to change things dramatically and to change things drastically. See, Jesus, at that moment in time, probably became a hero to a lot of people around him who saw him do this, but he also at the same time made a lot of enemies. And so a short time afterwards, Jesus leaves Jerusalem where he was celebrating the Passover, and he heads back towards Galilee where he spent most of his time ministering. And he would go back, but he, in order to get there, 
in order to get from Galilee, or in order to get from Judea, where Jerusalem was, to Galilee, he had to go through a little province called Samaria. Now, most of you know that the Samaritans, we have the, we have the, um, the illustration of the Good Samaritan, right? And most of you know that story. But the Jews and the Samaritans did not associate with each other. They did not get along with each other. But for Jesus to travel, or for anybody for that matter, to travel from Jerusalem to Galilee, look where he had to go. He had to go right through Samaria. Or, in some cases, the Jewish people would not even bother to deign to dirty their sandals in Samaria, so they would take a circuitous route and go around it. It was that big of a deal in that culture. And so Jesus leaves Jerusalem, but, but on his way there, he doesn't take the circuitous route. He takes the most direct route, goes right through Samaria. You ever had one of those God moments when it's like, that was a divine appointment. There's no possible explanation why God put a person in our life at a certain moment in time. I mean, it's just so obvious do we take advantage of that opportunity when God presents it? Or do we ignore it? Or do we run from it? Are there people in your life that God has put in your life that you try to avoid? I'll be all, all by myself. Not right? I mean, 45 years in the transportation business, I had employees I would go out of my way to avoid. Because it was nothing but negativism. And yet now I look back, now that I've retired and I no longer associate with them, I look back and I wonder, I wonder, did I really make an impact in their life? Did I really make the impact that I could have made had I made more of an effort to be involved in their life? And at some point in time, you know, you, there's only so much you can do as far as being involved in somebody's life in a business standpoint. But I think oftentimes God puts those opportunities in front of us that we miss totally and completely or we ignore completely and pretend like it doesn't exist. But Jesus starts out and he heads to Jerusalem. Now, the, the whole thing between the Samaritans and the Jews go, went back several hundred years before when the, when the kingdom of Israel was divided, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and I don't mean to bore you with history, but it help, kind of helps put it into context. So you had the northern kingdom. The Assyrians, which was one of the most brutal, bloody cultures of the time, came in and took over the northern kingdom. They began to, to intermarry, and so the Jews in that northern kingdom actually became immersed in the culture of the Assyrians that had come over and taken over. And so the people in the southern kingdom began to look at them as Samaritans. They were outcasts. And the, the thing about it was, in Jesus' day and time, it wasn't so much that, it, not only was it that the Jews didn't care for them or couldn't stand them, but the other side of the culture couldn't stand them either. They were kind of caught in the middle, and literally on the map, they were caught in the middle between Judea and Galilee. But here comes Jesus, and he goes right through it, right through the heart of it. And we pick up the story in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It says this, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Now, isn't it just like the disciples to be keeping score? Oh, man, John's been doing hundreds. Oh, but now Jesus' disciples are doing more hundreds. We can't have that. I mean, you can hear the wheels turning right in that one little statement. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing but his disciples. Isn't it interesting that nowhere in the Bible does it ever mention that Jesus baptized somebody? You know that? So when you think it's baptism as a condition of salvation, I guess Jesus never saved anybody. Oh, that opened up some eyes. Wrong, okay? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus baptized anybody, but he had trained his disciples to go out, and they were already going out at this point in time, which is fairly early in Jesus' ministry, to go out and reach people for Jesus, to tell them about Jesus, what he was doing, why he came, and to baptize them. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee, right through Samaria. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, high noon. There's a couple of things of real, really 
really significant things in that little portion of Scripture right there. The first thing is this. Jesus was tired. He was human. Because I think sometimes we look at Jesus and say, well, you know, Jesus was God's son. Jesus was God in the flesh. So it was a little different for him to be able to withstand temptation. It was a little different for him not to, not to be overtaken with some of the things that we let our lives get bogged down with. Wrong. Jesus was fully human because anything less means that we don't have a perfect sacrifice for our sins. It would be easy to say, well, Jesus was God's son. It was easy for him. No. Jesus experienced every emotion. He experienced every situation that you and I could ever imagine before us, and he came down to experience it for us and with us. He was tired. In that statement, we see that Jesus was fully human and what was going on, going on around him. The second thing was that we see here is that as Jesus is traveling through here, he picks a moment where he sits down by this well. And don't think this happened by accident. This is not a random circumstance that just happened. And when he sits down by this well, it was high noon. This was not a time when people would typically and traditionally come to the well to bring water out of it. The ladies would come, the women of the village would come during the early morning hours or later in the evening to get their water for the day or to finish the evening with the water. High noon was not a time, but Jesus is there at high noon. And then we see one of the most loved, one of the most poignant stories in the whole Bible. We know it as the story of the woman at the well. There is so much significance and it is such a rich story. It doesn't matter where you're at in your walk with the Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, huge significance here because it demands a choice from us. It demands a choice from you. Will you accept Jesus as your Savior or will you reject him? There's no alternative. For those of us, those of you who have been Christians for a hundred years, it never gets old talking about what spring of water are you drawing your life's blood from? What spring of living water are you tapping into for the source of your strength? Because no matter where we're at in our walk with Christ, it's so easy to get diverted by what's going on in the world around us. It's so easy to get diverted. Some things that we think of as, as even as important like grandkids and family and kids oh huge importance don't get me wrong here but sometimes even ministry can become more important than following christ if that makes sense sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the business in the minutia of what's going on around us that we miss that fact that we need to drink from that pure source the living water that jesus came to bring us and so as we see Jesus sitting down beside this well, we're reminded that, see, Jesus never goes anywhere that he doesn't want to go. Jesus never asks us to go anywhere that he doesn't want us to go. But the second part of that is, do you go where Jesus wants you to go? Do you go when he says, I need you to go do this. I need you to talk to this person. I need you to have an impact in this person's life. I need you to straighten something out in your life. Are we obedient? Do we hear God's voice? Do we recognize him when he speaks into our heart those things? And conversely to that, do we go places where Jesus doesn't want us to go? Do we go places where Jesus wouldn't go? Now that kind of doesn't really limit it that much because the people that Jesus associated with are the very people that we tend to draw away from. It seems like the closer we get to Christ, the farther away from the very people that he hung out with. So Jesus is tired and he sits down by the well. High noon, it's hot. He sends his disciples off, go find some food, I'm tired. Probably tired of his disciples asking questions. But he sends them off and he's there alone. And in John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, it says this, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Huge relevance in this conversation. Huge relevance. First of all, Jesus is a man, obviously, and she's a woman, obviously. Now, the men and women in that culture did not intermingle. They did not, you would not talk, if you were a man, you would not talk to a strange woman outside your home. You would talk to your wife, obviously, maybe some, some close uh, family members, but you wouldn't have this kind of a conversation with a woman outside the home. Culturally, it didn't happen. Not only was it a woman, but it was a Samaritan woman. And if people, if the disciples, when they come back, if they had been there at this moment, they would have been like, Jesus, you can't do that. Don't you know she's a Samaritan? Stop. You can't talk to her. It's culturally wrong. But Jesus picked a moment when it was just him and her, just the two of them, one-on-one, having this conversation. And not only was she a Samaritan woman, but she was an outcast. She wouldn't have come to the well at noon She came to the well at noon because she didn't want to be around all the other women who were looking at her as an outcast, looking at her as someone who had a past, looking at her as someone who was not. Now, this poor lady was not only not accepted, she was not accepted as a Samaritan, but now she's not accepted as as a woman in her own culture because of her past. And not only was she a Samaritan woman with an, as an outcast with a promiscuous past, which we're going to see in a minute. Coming to the well at noon to avoid confrontation. But Jesus is talking to her as a known rabbi. Now, not only does a man not talk to a woman, but for a rabbi to talk to a woman, no, didn't happen culturally. Couldn't happen. It didn't happen. And yet here's Jesus having this conversation with this woman. His compassion for her overrode every cultural barrier that possibly could have existed at that time his compassion for her to reach into her heart and reach somebody who knew they needed something in her life besides what she was going after although she didn't realize it at the moment so when you take all that into context and you see the barriers that jesus broke at that moment in time when he had this conversation with the samaritan woman is huge, and the implications for us are huge. See, Jesus constantly broke, all through his ministry, he constantly broke those social and cultural barriers to reach into the hearts and lives of people. Tax collectors hated Samaritans, Jews, Gentiles. It didn't matter. Jesus would recognize the need, and he would reach out to them in his compassion and fill that need. Isn't it interesting that nothing elevates people higher in their standards than the biblical standards of Christianity? When you take the moral standards that the biblical standards of Christianity put out there, it lifts the whole moral standard of an entire culture. And when that culture drifts away, which we've seen through the Israelites, through the history of the Israelite people, the morality goes down, And the corruption exists, comes in, takes over, and guess what? That culture ceases to exist or just degrades itself to the point where it's no longer effective in the world in which it lives. It was true then, and it's still true today. It's so easy for us to get wrapped up in the polarization of political, uh, the, the polarizing effect of the culture we live in, and that's why we reach into the outreach programs that we do, reach wide, unleash compassion, right? Our core mission statement, part of our core mission statement. That's why we do 360 Serve. We have indigenous pastors that we support, and some of you as families, individual families, are supporting pastors too. $50 a month, do you know how many people they're reaching worldwide for the love of Jesus Christ? People are being baptized by the thousands in Tanzania and in China and in Bangladesh and in Thailand and the Philippines, all over the world. Just revival as people are coming back to know, coming to know Jesus in, in volume and levels that, that are unprecedented in the United States. And we can be part of that. 
That's why we do that, because Jesus sees beyond those cultural barriers to the hearts and lives of people and what people really need, the love of Jesus Christ. I said this earlier, and I'll say it again. It seems like the closer we get to Christ, the further we get from the very people that Jesus hung out with, doesn't it? I mean, we don't, we don't, wanna, we don't, we don't want to dirty ourselves with, with that part of the culture that's socially to us and culturally unacceptable. We don't want to go there. We want to be separate. We want to separate ourselves from for Christ. We want to be more like him. Well, if you want to be more like him, then go and hang out with the very people that Jesus hung out with. That's not easy to do. How do you do that? I don't know for you, but pray and ask God for those divine appointments and ask him to reveal those moments to you and make it plain to you that this is Jesus who's putting these opportunities in front of you to be obedient to him, to reach somebody for him. We have the question. John, 11, John 4, 11 through 15. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? There's the question. See, she's looking at it from a human standpoint. She's looking at it from a physical standpoint. Her need was physical. Jesus transcends that. And he says this. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. I, she still doesn't get it. She's still looking at this from her physical need. I won't have to come to this well anymore. I won't have to be ostracized by the community, or at least publicly. I won't have to put myself out there to come here at noon if you'll give me water so that I don't have to keep coming here. She's still missing the boat, still searching for that which could not feed the 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 existing desire in her heart and in her soul that was thirsting for Jesus Christ, thirsting for something that she was created for that she didn't recognize yet. She was searching in all the wrong places to fill that thirst in her soul. And then Jesus does something very interesting in, chap in chapter 4, verses 16 to, to 20. He says, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. She replied, up until this point, her conversations have been drawn out, but now when Jesus hones in on her past, she sounds like she's a little embarrassed by what her past is. Just a short little sense, I have no husband. No more detail. She doesn't want to go into detail, but Jesus saw right through her. He said to her, you're right. You're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And I think even though that sounds condemning, I don't think Jesus was saying that in a condemning way. I think he was saying it to make her realize that the issue here is bigger than the water that was in that well. The issue here was the water that she needed to drink for her soul. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Isn't it interesting that she kind of deflects the question there? And don't we do that when somebody brings up something that we don't want to talk about or we don't want to go there? It's easy to deflect. And what she's saying there is, well, we say we worship here on this mountain, but you Jews worship in the temple. You say you have to worship in the temple, but yet at the same time, we're not allowed to go there because we're not 100% Jews. So what's the deal here? How can I become a, a, a person of God if, you, if I'm not even allowed to worship in your temple? Trying to deflect what Jesus is seeing right through here in her heart. And then Jesus says the answer is only found in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Him. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. John chapter 14, verses 17 through 26 says this. Jesus declared 
Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvations from the Jews. Well, now you stop right there and you think, well, now that's, that's not right. Didn't Jesus come for everybody? John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible. You watch an NFL football game and you'll know John 3.16, right? The guy with the clown and the colored hair. For God so loved the what? God so loved the what? You are out there. God so loved the world. He didn't say, so God so loved the Jews. He didn't say, because God so loved the Americans. God so loved the Ethiopians or the Chinese or whatever. He said, God loved the world. Every single one of us, regardless of our cultural standard, regardless of our cultural situation, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of who we are, where we came from, and regardless of what we've done. Jesus loves us just the same. Part of his great creation. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. I, think, I find it interesting that she has a little bit of Bible background here. Even the Samaritans knew the Old Testament. There was enough, even through several generations from the time that, that the Assyrians had taken over to the time that Jesus was there, there was some kind of biblical knowledge there, just enough to start asking questions about what, what is this really all about? And Jesus had the answer, didn't he? She said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Once and for all, Jesus made the pronouncement, I am the Messiah, I have come to save you. It's interesting that the, that the word that's used there twice is declared. And in the, in the context of the Bible and in the interpretation of it, the word declare was a decree of official order. There had to be some authority behind it. There had to be the top level of authority behind it in order to make a decree. A king in the Old Testament would say, I'm going to make a decree that Daniel shall be burned in the lion's den. Different story for a different time. But a decree had some authority behind it. And when Jesus declared that he was the Messiah, I am the one that you speak of, declared once and for all that he is the Messiah and that he has come to break the cultural barriers of the world that we live in. Salvation is offered to all, even a Samaritan, even a Samaritan woman with a sordid past, a promiscuous past. And I don't know what your past is, Take it back. Some of you I do. We won't go there. But whatever your past is, it doesn't matter. Jesus came for you. He died for you. He came and died for the Samaritan woman. He offered that wellspring of life, that pure water that comes from the source itself, the person of Jesus Christ. In some respects, we are the Samaritan woman, aren't we? See, there's a thirst, there's a hunger in our souls that we cannot fill through anything that this earth throws at us, that anything that this world offers us. And yet at the same time, we search for everything that can possibly fill that hunger and that thirst that God created us to have. And we look for it in every place but the source. See, a cistern, you know what a cistern is? It's not brethren and cistern. This is a cistern, a well, okay? It's, even a well can become stagnant and contaminated. Even a natural body of water like a lake or a stream can become contaminated that we talked about right at the beginning. And Jesus is the master of metaphors. He says he is the spring of living water. The idea is a pure source of life springing 
from him into our very souls, filling us with that void that he created within us to seek him out and to live for him and to have a relationship with him. And when we look at other people and we look at them and, and, and we look at them as maybe not quite up to our level of standard, maybe that neighbor that you have a hard time getting along with, maybe a coworker, a boss, an employee, maybe somebody, a relative, maybe a family member that you have a hard time getting along with. When you, when you think about that Jesus came to die for them as much as he died for you, that puts it in perspective, doesn't he? They are no better, they're no lower than you. You are no better than they are. We're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we look for that source of living water anywhere than from what Jesus came to give us, it can become so polluted. It can become so contaminated. Think about it this way. What do you do with your spare time? What's the latest thing you binge watched? How much time do you spend on your phone and where do you go on it? What do you do in your spare time? Is it coming from a pure source? Or is it coming from a source and maybe on the surface it's, it's all innocent and legitimate and it's no harm done? But where is it leading you? Is it diverting your attention away from the person of Jesus Christ? Is it diverting your attention away from the things that Jesus wants you to be involved in and things that Jesus wants you to do? There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. Social media, your phones, computers. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong. But does it take priority in your life? Is it taking precedence over Jesus? Are you drinking from a spring that's other than the pure source of life that Jesus came to give us? You can't stop that spring that's flowing from your heart once it takes root. And when you feed it, when you foster it, when you dive into it, when you absorb it, when you let it become part of your DNA and part of your life, it's unstoppable. I had a beautiful picture of this. A couple of years ago, we were up on the Mokolomi River, and my grandson, don't ask me why I wanted to build a dam. Okay, you know, you, that's fine. For an hour and a half, he picked up rocks and moved them from one place to another. And you know what? He couldn't stop the flow of water. No matter where he put the rocks. Well, it's coming out here, put a rock there. Oh, now it's coming out over here, put a rock there. Oh, it's coming out over here, put a rock there. No matter where he put the rocks, the water was still flowing. That's a picture of Jesus' water flowing in us and through us. It's unstoppable. It's what we're, we were created for. To live with that kind of living water springing out of us. Out of us. So I ask you this morning, what source are you drinking from? What is the source of your soul that you're drinking from this morning? What is it that, that you just want and desire more than anything else? Because anything other than Jesus Christ will leave you empty. Oh, it may be great for a while. And it may be, it may be this is all fun and games for now. But eventually, people let you down. Eventually, it comes to wanting more, wanting bigger. Wanting better because there's no source that satisfies you other than the source of Jesus Christ, the eternal water, the spring water flowing in us and through us. Come back to the source. If you've drifted away, if you know Jesus and you've drifted away from that source, come back. There's no better place to be than the center of God's will for your heart and your life. Psalm 42, 1 and 2, David said it really well when he said, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And what's really cool about the story even more is this lady, this Samaritan woman, runs back to town and she tells the townspeople what's happened. And the Bible tells us that the whole town, many in the town came to know Jesus because of her testimony, because of what Jesus did in her heart and life. Are you multiplying like that? Are you keeping your faith compartmentalized in that space just for you? Or is it flowing? Is there evidence 
in your life that's what's coming out of you? Is it coming from a pure source or is it coming from a contaminated source? Just a little food for thought this morning. What source are you drinking from? What is it that drives you? What is it that makes you thirst and hunger and thirst for more? Are you going to the well, the only well, the only pure source of life that can fill that void? Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you this morning for this message. We thank you that all through the life of your son Jesus, that you took the time to look into our hearts, to look into the hearts and lives of people, that you broke those barriers of cultural and ethnic ethnicity that, that just build up around us. Father God, I pray that you would speak into our hearts and lives this morning, that you would bring us back to the wellspring of life, that you would just show us that that desire that we have within us, that hunger, that thirst is for you. that the thing that we desire most is to have fellowship with the Father. That we were created for that, and we were created like that. And so, Father, this morning, for all of us here, wherever we're at in our relationship with you, I just pray that you would speak into our hearts and that we would be that sponge soaking up the pure, uncontaminated water that is the source of Jesus Christ. We thank you. We love you. We thank you that you loved us so much, every one of us equally, that you sent your son to die for us. Father God, may we live like that. May we live for that. In your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Well, thanks for being here this morning. Have a great day. I hope you will come back and join us tonight for our family night. It's going to be a fun time. Uh, just come and hang out, eat, relax, enjoy the fellowship. And uh, then we will see you when we see you, hopefully before next Sunday. But if not, we'll see you tonight and then next Sunday. God bless. Have a great week.